Lewis, I'm just wondering, I'd like to start with an unusual question, just so that the listeners know that nothing is planned. We're in complete free yep. fall. We haven't okay. discussed what we're going to talk about. So in 1981, what was Lewis's life plan? Ah, well, 1981, I think I was still very much um, looking at becoming a composer and uh, sort of looking at the life of the people working in the music department at Sydney Uni where I studied and thinking, well, you know, I'll take a few classes a week and um, spend the rest of the time composing and, uh, you know, having a, a great time. But uh, that all changed in 1982. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was offered some teaching. I was very lucky when I graduated, and um, so I started teaching in the music department, and um, uh, it kind of took over my life, really. <laughs> so, so, so nowadays, how many students a year do you teach, approximately? Well, if you're counting lectures, it's yes. um, close to 300, I think. Yeah, yes, yeah. and you've been doing that sort of uh, at various numbers like that since ni that 1982 when you started, but it, was, it would have been oh, it was Yeah, much less in those days, yes. yeah. And even uh, when I started full-time at the con, we probably only had, you know, 80 students or something all up, I think, yeah. So it's only grown in the last um, 20 years or so to the, the crazy numbers we have these days. So, yeah. so, so for, the, for the 27 people in New South Wales who haven't been in one of your lectures. Can you, can you explain what, actually what you, what you teach? Uh, well, I teach um, harmony and analysis, and um, it's basically what people think of as music theory, I suppose. But um, as I always say in my first lecture, I'm not very keen on the, the term theory because um, it's really about practice. It's really you know, about um, how composers achieve what they want to do. And we learn by doing it more than anything else, rather than just kind of talking about it and thinking about it, but in a practical way by actually writing music. You know? So, so, you, so you, I saw this great quote that you, that, uh, you teach them to appreciate all the rules that the great composers managed to break. Uh, yeah. Well, that's pretty much it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes. that's um, yeah, as a starting point. You you learn you know what you're supposed to do, and then you can gradually start stretching the boundaries as you as you gain an understanding of how that works. Yeah. Good. And, and Lewis, have over the years have you noticed a change in any way with the sort of the, the quality of the students? Uh, has it been fairly constant? Um, I think we've always had uh, a really amazing sort of group of students at the at the top end, and um, uh, we probably have a few more students with very limited background in theory coming in now, because of the way the high school system works, and also we don't have an entrance test anymore, so we have students coming in who are really at um, the first stage in terms of you know where to put the notes on the staff and so on <laughs> so so there's a bit of a challenge there in, in balancing between the you know those outstanding ones and the ones um, at the other end who you know have a lot of potential but um, we've got to help them through the early stages I mean there was a famous case as a singer from Israel who um, came in and she got zero in her entrance test and uh, she ended up getting distinctions in second year you know it was it was so satisfying that she yes. um, you know just caught up and, and exceeded uh, what many of her colleagues were doing but um, uh, I think the middle is a bit smaller these days you know we had used to have a lot of students sort of in between the extremes, but it's a little more polarised these days. Yes. Um, somebody I was talking to yesterday actually suggested that might be a reflection of a bit of a sort of private school versus state school education, but um, I don't have any, any data to verify that. I don't know. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so the thing that I noticed from the moment I arrived at the Sydney Conservatory, which was after your, uh, when you started, with every student I spoke to is always just so uh, admiring and positive about your lectures. So that stayed very constant. Uh, uh, and do you enjoy the, 
the teaching as much as you used to with a different cohort of students? Yeah, even more so, I think, because I think every year I know a little bit more, so I feel, I feel more worthy of standing in front of them and actually sort of delivering I think what you just stuff, said, you know. feeling more worthy, explains why you are such a legend with, um, with students. And I know uh, so many students are going to watch this and, and just um, remember your lectures with such fondness. But let's go back to Lewis's. How did... Where did it all start for you, your musical education? Um, well, I started on guitar as a, um, uh, in a, a primary school student. No, I was learning <laughs> classical guitar. I used to go along to Mrs. Williams at Mona Vale and yes. with Philip Moran. He was um, in my class who later became a much better guitarist than I ever was. But um, that was the starting point, simply, I think, because our next-door neighbour um, had... Uh, her son's guitar in a cupboard and um, used to sort of let me get it out and strum it and I was just totally captivated by the, the sound, you know, it just so seemed what, to be what a lot of at that point? Uh, oh, about seven or eight or something like that, I think. Yes. Yeah. And your parents thought this is the instrument for you? Uh, well, it was a starting point, yeah, yes. yeah. But then I got interested in orchestras and things, so I, um, I uh, switched to oboe uh, yeah switched to oboe eventually at high right. school and um so so when you said you got interested in orchestras was this from listening to music or yeah very much so yeah my father had a had a very good um record collection and um i devoured it fairly <laughs> enthusiastically and they used to take me along to concerts and things too so i was well um inculcated with uh, classical music from an early age and always enjoyed it. Yeah. And the oboe, of course, always features so beautifully in the orchestra, so I can understand why you chose the oboe. And your um, oboe teacher? Uh, originally, um, Diana Craig, who's right. um, you know, just so inspiring. So Actually, I say originally, she was my, my long-term oboe teacher, really. Um, I had uh, another one before that, but um, yes. yeah. Um, I never really sort of did the hard yards on the <laughs> Very I think it's a good time now that <laughs> Very <laughs> careless with practical, um, you know, with the, uh, the sort of technical work. And so, so um, my lessons used to turn into uh, duet sessions mostly. We'd pull out some bark or some telemann or something and, and play through these duets and have pastries and coffee and something. But um, it was what I needed, I think, as, a, um, as somebody you know, studying tertiary music, which was really quite a full-on degree, and um, it was really nice just to spend a morning doing that, you know, yes. and just enjoying music rather than sort of sweating over it. Yeah. Yes, and, and uh, so once you started teaching here, uh, how, what happened to your actual composing? Because, I mean, it's sort of notorious once you get a job at a university, <laughs> it's difficult to maintain yeah. the, that, that passion because you're so busy. Yeah, I, I really found um, it was too much like my day job or something. I think um, uh, I went full-time in about 1990, and um, the last really substantial piece I finished was 1991, I think. So <laughs> it kind of tells the story, yeah. But, um, I don't know, I, I, I just sort of felt... Um, I wasn't sure that I was writing the sort of music that I wanted to listen to, so I thought, you know, if I don't want to listen to it, why, why would anyone else? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, it, it kind of just receded in my priorities, I think. One of our colleagues, uh, Margaret Crawford, who you would remember, the, the, the flute player, said that jobs choose people, uh, mm -hmm. people don't choose jobs. And I, it sounds like that was the case I, I think so, yeah. Yes. My mother has always said, you know, I always knew you were going to be teaching in some way. You know, she, that was, you know, the way she saw my life panning out. So, yeah. But if someone had said that to Lewis, aged 15, 16, 17, you would have been probably annoyed. With the fact that probably, were, yeah, I would yes. have thought, yeah. I haven't yet met someone of that age. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, I yeah. want to be a teacher. No, that's probably right. Yeah. Teacher, yes. No, yeah, I, I think at that age you don't quite realise, you know... Um, uh, what a, a rich sort of thing it can be, you know, and, and rewarding and fulfilling sort of experience to teach. Yeah. And, and whilst you're teaching here, you've been playing in oboe in the Korean uh, yeah, 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 few. Orchestra. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And and how does that feel? Does that feel like your day job as well, or does that feel? Uh, no, no, it's completely um, different. Yeah, it's quite different. Yeah, I really, um, I just 
enjoy the practicality of it and you learn so much about music by playing in an orchestra you know playing Debussy or something and, and just being part of these harmonies you know just being one instrument in a, an ensemble and tuning and timing and everything you you learn a huge amount about music I think and um, uh, it's also socially really good you know I've met a lot of people who aren't um, academics you know, so so it's, it's really nice from that point of view too yes yes and uh, uh, so do you do anything outside of music as, as, a, as, a, as a sort of life enhancing thing <laughs> Are you Probably. a rock climber? Or are you no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty well known as for, for um, being a, a regular tennis player. I think that's the usual sort of Monday morning conversation is, did you play tennis on the weekend? You know, that's the sort of thing. Yeah, which is a bit similar to playing the orchestra in a way. It's a, it's a great um, social thing and a, a, a nice... Um, a nice release, you know. It's 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 a re I call it a sanity sanity pill. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And and, and do you just going back to the teaching at the start of every academic year, are you filled with the same sort of anticipation and excitement? You, you the were? teaching, yes. The administration just seems to get worse every year, and I uh, well, I dread we've, that. We've sat through some very productive uh, meetings over the years. <laughs> <laughs> Would you change the world? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I'm spared meetings mostly these days, but um, we just spend our lives filling out spreadsheets and all sorts of rubbish, you know. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that that seems to become worse all the time. But, um, but yeah, I always... Because I, I used to do the timetable years ago at the con, and... Uh, I always remember, because um, that uh, was just crazy. Just rush, let's just not rush it. So <laughs> let's just talk about this for a while. For the next half an hour. You used to do the timetable for, the, for all the lectures. Yeah, Peter McCallum was doing it before me, and then he passed it on to me. And Thanks, Peter. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, it was a challenge. But, um, but I just remember, you know, I mean, the phone, there wasn't so much email in those days. The phone was ringing just constantly, you know, in the beginning of the semester, and there were all sorts of... Uh, fires to put out and so on and to walk into the lecture theatre shut the door and the darkness descends and there's just quiet and that was so fantastic you know just to spend an hour just talking about music and get away from all of that sort of rolling crisis of the timetable you know every week always. Now Lewis we're sitting in for us what is still the new conservatorium. Mm. Uh, can we talk about the conservatorium building what it was like when you first arrived here? Yeah, well, it was a bit different for us because we were in Lendley's house um, down at the quay, you know, so the performance stuff was happening around so the about here. So the students sort of moved backwards and forwards. Yeah, yeah. Across and Macquarie Street. Yeah, Lendley's house was one of um, Harry Seidler's first buildings, I think, and it was notorious for, for being uphill. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> it had its problems and it had these louvers on the outside that were... Uh, affected by the warping and you couldn't adjust them and so on but um, but it was a lovely spot you know to enjoy the view and that cafe down the bottom with the, the Greek ladies running it and so on you know it was really, really a fun place to be it was nice but um, then we moved up to Pitt Street to um, uh, By Wynyard Station Yeah 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 which was very convenient yeah, Yes Yeah but a bit of a Well look I think that, let's, let's put it in the uh, uh, Put this in perspective. It's very convenient for Lewis, but not very convenient for the students who were traipsing backwards and forwards between the two buildings. Oh, not f no. Yes, from that point yes. of view, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It was funny because it did create this sense of division um, because you know there was this sense that um, this was the real con and we were not part of the real con. You know, so whenever we came to the Greenway, as it was sort of known. Um, you know, we always felt like strangers a bit walking into the building. Yeah, it was very strange. But um, and, so, and, and then did you actually move out to Redfern as well or not? No, we were in Pitt Street. So you still stayed there? I'd heard the yeah. that because, of mm. course, the performance staff moved out to the yeah. old engine shed, so the, the, yeah. the, the gap was even greater. It was, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It took quite a long time to travel between the two venues. And so, so do you remember mm. when we moved back into this building and for the first time... We were all back in the same building. Mm. Do you remember that time? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I remember walking in the front doors for the first time and thinking, my God, this is all ours. <laughs> I couldn't believe, you know, that we had this amazing, you know, the atrium is very impressive and um, it was um, exciting. And 
yeah, the way the building is laid out, we have our offices as academics sort of are abutted by the performance corridors and things. So we've got keyboard, um, you know, right next to us, basically. So when we walk out, out of our offices, we're walking past Gerard's room and, and so on. And, and um, it's really nice. It's great. And, and, and of course, your office has a reasonably good view, doesn't it? That's also a bonus, and even better, I think, is being able to open the window in the afternoon and let the sea breeze come in. I think that's, it's really special, which is revival of what would have been the experience of everyone, you know, in the original Greenway building. Yeah. That's right. Mm. So, Lewis, um, you are such a popular and well-loved uh, lecturer uh, here at the Con. You've had such an influence on so many students, uh, and uh, uh, thank you so much for doing this interview. You're a real treasure. <laughs> Thank you.